Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our inaugural tasting uh, with the Wine Foundry. I am Stuart Ake from the winery, and we're going to be talking about some Blancs here. Uh, we're we're going to be starting with a Blanc slate or shooting Blancs with two wines tonight of our four, uh, our whole series is going to be called Three Blancs and a Philosopher. And, but tonight we're going to be focusing in on two different wines. We're going to be focusing in on our Blanc de Blancs, our 2013 Blanc de Blancs uh, sparkling wine, Chardonnay. And then after we do that one, we're going to kind of move into our uh, 2018 Pinot Blanc. I recommend you get a couple of glasses out uh, and some water if you have some snacks. Let's do it. So why the pun? Okay, why the, why the pun with the Blancs? Well, we're, tonight we're going to be focused in on two white grapes, and they both have origins in Burgundy in kind of central uh, eastern France. Um, but these grapes are going to be radically different, even though they're from the same region and they share some similar characteristics. Um, radically, radically different interpretations of these varietals. So uh, the 2013 Blanc de Blancs comes from a vineyard, which we'll get into in a little bit, called San Giacomo. The San Giacomo family owns a few properties in Sonoma County, and this one is going to be called the Roberts Road site. And then we're going to go to a different region, a little bit further north in California, into Mendocino, an area called Anderson Valley, where we're going to check out where we grow the Pinot Blanc. So why do we put these grapes together besides this Blanc's name? Well, these grapes really thrive in cool weather. So uh, let's start with the Blanc de Blancs and we'll see why it needs cool weather. I'm gonna open up my bottle. If you haven't opened up yours, we can get to it. I'm gonna to try to do this gracefully, maybe partly on screen, partly off screen. I'm gonna kind of put my finger over the, over the cage. And, you know, a lot of people, when you're, when you're, when you're tasting uh, sparkling, so I just usually twist it. Ta -da. Um, actually, you know, when you're opening sparkling, you are welcome to, you know, like you're allowed to point it at people. Often gets you in trouble, especially in certain parts of the country. But if, you know, if somebody's giving you a hard time, you can go that direction. In terms of glass, look, wine culture has a glass for everything. You can, uh, you can drink out of a flute. Uh, you know the, the, uh, the coupe uh, inspired by Marie Antoinette. Um, you can go into what some people would consider a Bordeaux glass or a Burgundy glass. For right now, if you want to toast with me, I'm going to pour my Blanc de Blancs into my glass and I'm going to just pour it into a regular glass. And the reason I, I don't always drink out of flutes is because uh, I, I like to get the aromatics. And as you can tell, I've got a a very large nose, and so it makes makes it a lot easier to get in here. Ladies and gentlemen, if you want to kind of toast to the screen, we're going through unprecedented times, but we can still be civilized and have a great time. Cheers. Cheers. Okay. That's a nice way to start. So that is Blanc de Blancs. So um, how is a Blanc de Blancs made? Well, first of all, again, like I mentioned before, it starts with the grape and the grape is Chardonnay. Okay. And what we're going to do is I'm going to kind of show you where we source our, uh, the Chardonnay for our Blanc de Blanc. So we're going to kind of go into, uh, I'm going to show you a little map here. And I don't know if you can see my cursor, but um, what we have here is, here's San Francisco, okay? Uh, so we're right around the bay. And just, this is called Marin County, where some people are kind of tuned in from. But here we go, we're gonna head a little bit north into, this is Sonoma County, okay? And Sonoma, by, by size, 
it's pretty big. It's a pretty big region. Uh, it's got 17, almost 1,800 square miles of space. By comparison, the state of Rhode Island, only 12, uh, 1,200 square miles. So Sonoma County is bigger than the state of Rhode Island. For right now, we're going to kind of focus in on this southern part here. Let me see if I can get a, um, uh, a little drawing thing going here for you. So we're gonna focus in on this southern part right down here. And it, the reason I, I wanna focus in on this is these grapes were grown in a section of Sonoma County called the Petaluma Gap. Okay, what's the big deal? Petalu Chardonnay needs cold weather. Here in Southern Sonoma, temps are very, very cool. And the way, the way it works is this. On our California coast, you always hear about the fog in San Francisco, right? And the, the, the fog pushes right up to the coast. And I'll go back to that screen share because I kind of want to point out, there's a couple of areas where the fog comes in. One of them is down here by San Francisco. And then we call this area by Petaluma, the Petaluma Gap, okay? And the Petaluma Gap, essentially, the reason they call it a gap is we've got two hills like this, and the fog is looking for a place to get through. One of them, further south by the Golden Gate Bridge, that's where the fog comes in and hits San Francisco and other parts of the San Francisco area. When we're in Sonoma County, this thing, the Petaluma Gap, there's a little space between two mountains, and the fog pushes in and settles over that. What's the big deal with fog? The fog prevents the grapes from getting too ripe. It's cold there during the day. The fog won't even burn off until usually around uh, about noon and then about 12 o'clock. And then it comes pushing back in 4.30, 5 o'clock and great winds come in. If we were trying to grow Chardonnay in a warmer region, like where we are in Napa Valley, it's, it, it, it's very difficult to find the right spot for Chardonnay in Napa Valley. So that's why we prefer to kind of grow it out there where it can retain its uh, acidity. The other thing that, uh, the, the other thing about uh, when you're making sparkling wine, you have to pick the grapes early. And so I sent you the technical cards earlier. And if you notice, we picked our grapes at, it's called, we measure it in, in this country in something called bricks. But in different regions of the world, they measure their, their sugars differently. But we picked it at 17.8 degrees bricks. What does that mean? That means super, super, very low sugar, really high acidity. The longer the grapes stay on the vine, the more the sugar goes up because photosynthesis, the leaves are allowing the, the sugars to accumulate in the fruit more. So as the sugars go up, your acid goes down. What we like about this when we taste is the acid, when you put it in your mouth, it makes your mouth water. It's kind of tart and that triggers a salivary reaction. It makes your mouth water. And then when your mouth is watering, you're looking for the, the proteins, the cheese or the food that is, uh, that is from, you know, from the uh, you know, kind of help, help temper that acid. I'm gonna go back and answer this question that just popped up. Uh, Mark uh, Ellenberger asks everybody, uh, is, is when I was kind of referring to the Sonoma Coast, is that up from San Pablo Bay? Let's kind of go back to that map super quick um, so I can kind of show you. Um, so the, this area right here, this, up, this is the Bay Area. When you hear about the Bay Area, here's San Francisco. It goes all the way down to a city called San Jose, all the way inland, close to pretty close to like say uh, south of Sacramento. And up here is Napa, Sonoma. So up here is it, Petaluma Gap kind of moves out towards San Pablo Bay. 
which kind of gets us in southern Napa as well. Um, so that is kind of how we grow the grapes there. We pick them early to preserve the acidity and we grow them in cold regions where it's very foggy, very windy to, uh, to help preserve the flavor. Now, so that's how it's grown. How is it made? Um, well, here's how fermentation works. So what we do is we're going out to the vineyards every few days during as we the approach up to harvest. And yes, we're measuring the sugars, but for us, it's also really more about flavor. Um, when I first started kind of working with wines, I was kind of a hippie guy, I had long hair, and I would pick, I would just listen to the grapes. Sounds kind of silly, but then I discovered chemistry and I kind of overcompensated for a little while looking for the numbers, the numbers, the numbers. And then I got to work with our director of winemaking, Patrick Sabo, and Patrick is kind of the best of both worlds. So he, he really picks on flavor going out there and we're going out together, taste, 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 but then he will, will bring samples back to the winery to measure the sugars, measure the acid, just so we can kind of figure out, hmm, is, is our, our perceptions of flavor uh, matching what we're getting in the lab? Or is what we're getting in the lab kind of get uh, what, what we're tasting at the same time? Then we eventually will pick the fruit and we'll bring it to the winery. And what you do for, for white wine is you stick all of the grapes in a press and you squeeze, when you're making white wine, squeeze the grapes and the juice comes out and you put it in a tank or in this case, we put it into a barrel and we ferment. And with, what happens is the yeast eats the sugar and converts it to alcohol. And, uh, and once we have that, we'll age it for a period of time to get more complexity. And then I'm gonna show you a video of after we've aged it in barrel for a number of months, now we go into the first part of what's called bottle aging, and we're gonna initiate a fermentation in bottle. So I'm gonna kind of show you this, where we, I'm gonna be putting the bottles on the line, and then this is not going to be this wine. This is actually going to be called a Brut Rosé. Um, and let's get this one going. So, and I know that the, the, uh, the, the little things are in the way. So what's going to happen is now the wine's been aging for a period. And I'm going to be dumping some glass on the bottle, on the, on the bottling line. And now the juice... We always refer to it as juice. So what happens here is these bottles are being what's called sparged. So we're, we are, if you can kind of see, we're, we're pushing, we're removing the gas from the bottles. And now the base wine is gonna go into bottle. And this is obviously a rosé. This was made with Pinot Noir, so that's why it's dark in color. And then the bottles are gonna continue down the line where we're going to uh where we're going to then put them over here where the we'll put a soda crown cap on them and then they will be aged in something called a uh let me see, get you back here then they're going to be aged for what we call tirage they're going to be bottle aged so what we did is when it was kind of being, when the wine was being filled in there, we are also putting two more things in there. We're putting a little dash of sugar and we're putting a little bit of yeast because we want to do the traditional method of doing a bottle fermentation. Now, if you go to a store, let's say you go to insert store here and you might see some sparkling wines for really low prices. That's usually not done in the champagne method or the traditional method. What they will do is they'll just take a still wine, let's say this Pinot Blanc, and they will force carbonate it, um, almost like drinking a soda pop, like they would with a, if, you, if you bought a, a, a soft drink. What we did instead was use the traditional method that they would do in champagne, where we put in a little bit of yeast and a little bit of sugar, and now the fermentation 
will occur in bottle, a secondary fermentation. And that's where the magic happens because that's where we get our bubbles. So um, just after we saw the end of that, I'm just gonna show you like now what's gonna happen is now the wines are gonna age in what we call uh, tirage. And let's get that for you. So you can see here, we're placing the bottles there in something called a gyro pallet. And it uh, looks like Steve is putting them in. And now they'll sit in that cage and it was, you saw that it was really hazy. That's the yeast, sugar. And what's gonna happen is we're gonna ferment and over time, we're gonna slowly tip that cage and slowly tipping that cage, it's like a riddle, what we refer to as a riddling rack. It'll coax the yeast into the neck of the bottle, but it's gonna be over the course of 18 months, 16 months, so a pretty long time. And, uh, um, and so then we will, uh, then we'll be able to taste the wine during that, get a sense of what it's doing, but that fermentation is happening in the bottle. So they're all that, what happens when the yeast eats the sugar, it produces carbon dioxide and that CO2 has no place to go. So it becomes trapped in, in solution in here. Um, what I'm gonna do is, uh, does anybody have any questions? You can kind of raise your, uh, raise your just raise your hand and I will, try to unmute you. I'm gonna kind of change my view. Anybody have any questions here? I'm gonna to go to Mark Ellenberger. Hey Mark, can you hear, can you, uh, are you unmuted? I am, can you hear me? Uh, we certainly can. Good, thanks very much. Uh, thanks very much for doing this, first of all. That's a lot sure. of fun. You know, we're all kind of stuck inside and I think everyone appreciates whatever outlet it is, be, be it virtual or otherwise. A uh, quick question. I know in the Taraj, you said that you put in sugar and yeast. Is it typical that in the traditional champagne method, which is what you're describing, mm -hmm. the still wine after aging before Taraj, is it completely dry and you have to reintroduce sugar in order to generate that second fermentation? Yeah, so you've introduced something called wine style. So with any wine that you make, you can do it in different styles. We prefer to make uh, we prefer prefer to make the yeast do all the work, eat all of that sugar, and convert it to alcohol, so that we're starting with a dry wine. Then we will introduce sugar in there. And the reason we like to do that is like first of all, we're going to be making what would be considered a brute interpretation of the grape. Brute means it's going to have very little. It for all intents. There is no sugar in that wine when it's uh, when it's done, and we'd like it so it'll be crisper, drier, um, and have more nuance. You can introduce sugar or keep sugar in there if you wanted a sweeter interpretation, but but we also do it not just because of that style, but we also want to control exactly what is in that environment. I hope that makes sense. So then we'll introduce the sugar. And then you talked about, uh, inter you know, with the introduction of sugar, there is another place where we can actually introduce sugar. And that is when we are aging the wine. I don't know if you noticed on that, but we were putting a soda cap uh, on that bottle, not a, uh, a traditional um, cork associated with champagne. So we just had, we just actually put a soda cap on there. And it's because we're gonna put the cork in the cage, uh, the misle, on there at another time. So why don't I actually show you that process of, uh, of what we're gonna do. So let's, we're gonna kind of flash forward uh, 18 months, now that the wine has been aging in there, and we're gonna go introduce, uh, I'm gonna show you now the wine kind of moving, we're gonna, we're actually with the, all that yeast is in the neck and I'll point that out, but then we're gonna freeze the neck of the bottle 
so that we can tilt it without all of the yeast going back into the wine. So we actually freeze the neck and then we'll pull that soda uh, cap off and put in the cork. So check this out here. Okay. So now, you can kind of see my thing. The bottle is, he's tipped him, taken him out of the gyro pallet face down so that the, the neck, all that the yeast remains in the neck. And now this is basically a big bath of what we, we call, it's glycol. It's kind of like a food grade antifreeze. And these necks are submerged in there. So it's basically an ice cube. And now we'll see them come out. And now if you look right there, sorry about that little terrible writing. Uh, if, now you'll see this little ice, ice cubes right there. And now what's gonna happen is they're gonna kind of move into the next phase where now that it's frozen, the tops are gonna be pulled off and the cork will be put, the, the cork will be put in. So you go from this ice cube that's pulled off and, uh, and, and, and then the cork is put in. But when Mark asked about sugar, when we pull that soda, the soda bottle top off, we might introduce a little sugar or different people will, might introduce more. And that is called dosage. And Patrick, our director of winemaking, will sit the team down at the table and we will taste the wine with the soda cap on there first. And we'll taste it at maybe 14 months, 15 months, just looking for the bottle complexity and aging that we're looking for. When we feel we've got it, then we'll see, is the acid too bright? Is it too sharp, too tart? If it is, we would have the option of introducing a minuscule amount of sugar in there. Other producers might put more in if they were going for a, a different interpretation, but we're going for that really brute um, dry. So, uh, I'll show you the, the kind of a last video here of that dosage, and you'll actually see the corks and the cage going on the bottle right now. Here we go. So now they've come out. You'll see the, if you look closely, you'll see the little soda crown on the left side. Then it goes through and very, very quickly, it pulls off that soda count and you can see that it's kind of bubbling up. It goes through uh, a little thing where dosage would take place. Maybe in addition of a little sugar to polish the back end of the palate. And then right over here, just some quality control measures. And then we'll see it going with the the pork and cage going in. And voila, we actually now have finished wine. Now what this is doing here is, uh, if you have any unruly children, we place them under that, that machine right there and the bottles just give them a little bonk on the head. Just kind of, you know, just teach them a little lesson, nothing, nothing inappropriate. And then over here is our final quality control, just to make sure that there was no yeast that kind of made it through there. Um, and of course, we would never advocate violence, of course, just being, just being kind of silly there. Um, that is sparkling wine. And our 2013, uh, we didn't release it until, you know, we, we let it sit for a couple of years to get some complexity. And you, if you're familiar with champagne, when they're doing their blends, they blend in stuff from, you know, five years, eight years. They'll have some stuff that's been uh, around for like 15 years just so they can get layers. I'm going to pour myself a wee bit more, just a wee little dram, uh, as, as my mother would say from Scotland. And that is the Blanc de Blancs from 2013. Cheers. I hope you're a little bit further along than I am in the tasting department. Um, 
Now we're going to kind of shift gears a little bit. We are going to introduce the next wine into the lineup tonight, which is going to be our 2018 Pinot Blanc. Um, so let's open that up. Uh, some people like there's different ways to do it. I usually use the waiter's friend. You are welcome to, if you have any, you know, use a hammer, um, the shoe method, which some of you might've seen, we've done a video on that. So I'm just going to remove the foil slightly off camera so that in case I cut myself, um, nobody will have to be subjected to that. And I hope everyone's having a good time and staying safe, right? So now we're going to do the Pinot Blanc. Now, Pinot Blanc uh, is actually related to Pinot Noir. So Pinot Noir, red grape, right? Also from Burgundy, where Chardonnay comes from, the Chardonnay that we used for uh, the, the Blanc de Blancs. Pinot Blanc is a mutation of Pinot Noir. Pinot Noir, and I shouldn't just say Pinot, but Pinot Noir is notorious for mutating. And one of those mutations you're probably familiar with is called Pinot Gris. There's another one called Pinot Meunier. And then another albino version of it, Pinot Blanc. So I'm just going to pour a little bit again. You know, in the wine industry, some people are like, oh, it should be in the Bordeaux glass. Oh, it should be in the Burgundy glass. They're just trying to sell you things. Um, like, so you don't need a separate glass for every single kind of wine. I actually do prefer personally to put to, uh, to drink Pinot Blanc in a Burgundy glass, which is kind of the more bulbous round one. It doesn't matter. Uh, So this is the 2018 Pinot Blanc from a, a vineyard called Schrader Ranch. If you're familiar with it, there's a, a producer that's pretty big called Navarro. And, uh, and that's where we kind of developed the relationship to source this fruit. And my glass is full. I hope yours has been full a few times. I propose a second toast to working together even though we might be from far apart physically, we can still be together in this new format. Cheers, everybody. I'm gonna get my nose in there, give it a little whirl. And look, why do we swirl? There's little esters, there's little compounds in the wine and they're volatile. When they're exposed to oxygen, they release. And when they release, you smell them more. And that's why we swirl, we're trying to release it it's interesting in the Southern hemisphere that, no, they do not swirl the wine the other way. But um, so we just get, we can kind of smell it more. I like to move it around my mouth so it can kind of hit everything, hit all the, hit all, hit all the different tissues for the front of the mouth, back of the mouth. There's a lot going on there. So, like I said before, uh, Pinot Blanc, also from Burgundy, just like uh, originally from Burgundy, just like the Chardonnay grape is, um, and it shares some, some similar characteristics. When we talked about Chard, we said it needs cold weather. Pinot Blanc loves cold weather too, during the growing season. Again, sugars go up, acid goes down. And if, if it's in a warm region, then your sugars are going to accumulate very rapidly and all of your acid's going to go out. And the acid's what make, makes the wine feel very, very lively. And you can make Pinot Blanc in a variety of styles. Some people prefer it in a richer, rounder style so that it's kind of slow and brooding. We, want, we really want to preserve that acidity. So that's why we grow it in a colder region. So I'm going to take you to a, I'm going to take you to a slightly different area of where we were before in Sonoma. And now we're going to kind of move up the coast a little bit. So here's the bay. Again, here is Sonoma. Here's, here's Napa Valley, a lot smaller than Sonoma. We only have 700, uh, 700 square miles versus 
uh, almost 2,000 square miles. And now we're going to go to uh, up here to Mendocino. So this is all Mendocino. So 3,000 square miles uh, of, of land. Where we're gonna pay attention to is this little road down here called Highway 128. Comes out of a, a little part of Northern Sonoma called Cloverdale. And this road looks really straight right now. But if you are on it, you are going to uh, wanna, you know, kind of drive very slowly because this is very, very windy and remote. And you'll of often have to take a couple of stops because it's so windy that, uh, that the belly gets a little, a little workout. And then we're gonna go into this little area right here called Philo. And uh, what's, what's so remarkable about Philo and Boonville, this little area? That area is uh, extremely, these are very, very small towns. The one called Boonville, they even have a bunch of words that they've kind of formed, like the, the kids in high school for ages made up their own language. And then it kind of became like a local adopted language to see if anybody like knows if you're really a local uh, Boont. Uh, it kind of became very famous from a beer here uh, called Boont Amber. Uh, people started finding out about that, but really the only thing there are that live there are let's say hobbits, hobbits and hippies really. So it's uh, um, it's a very remote area, and it, it not a lot of people live there because you have to take the highway 128 winding up there, and it, it's going to be a doozy. But what makes that special? What makes it so cold? If I go back really again, again is Right here, where this, this little town of Albion is, that is a, another gap, just like the Petaluma Gap, and the fog pushes right down this little channel and just sits on that. So it's always very foggy, windy, cold. Everyone talks like this, like pirates. That was kind of an Irish pirate, but it's because the wind is always blowing. And even though I don't have hair, my hair even blows there because it's, it's so windy, but it's very, very remote. But that cold weather, again, really helps preserve the acidity. So um, Pinot Blanc, how do we do this? How does this approach to fermentation differ from the sparkling? Okay, so what we do with white grapes, which is different from red, and we'll learn more about red grapes next week, we're going out to the vineyards. Again, we're tasting. We're looking for the acidity. We're looking for the flavor. We're bringing samples back to the winery. And then when we, uh, when, when we find that we have the right flavor that we're looking for, we're gonna, bring, we're gonna harvest the, the grapes. We always harvest very early in the morning um, when the fog is in because there's yeast on those grapes. And as soon as those grapes are picked, the yeast wants to start eating that sugar. So what we do is we harvest really in the morning, really early in the morning when the fog is still in and it's really cold because it's harder for the yeast to spontaneously ferment those grapes. We get them to the winery in, uh, in, in an hour, an hour and a half. Uh, so we're picking about 3.30 in the morning, 4.30 in the morning, get it to the winery about eight or nine in the morning. And then we put all of those clusters. So they, they're harvest, they're, everything's harvested by hand. We put all of those clusters into a press. And there's two different kinds of presses you can use in the industry. You can use what's called a basket press. And it's more of a traditional press where you have these kind of wooden slats and two, two plates. And you gently push those together to squeeze the juice out. You'll see those in kind of like traditional winemaking photos. Somebody kind of uh, turning a crank. Obviously, they're more a little more sophisticated now. It's computer generated, but it's the same principle of two, uh, two plates that squish together. We choose a different method, and we use what's called a bladder press, which is basically a cylinder. It almost looks like a, a very large tin can turned on its side, and we have a balloon in there, a canvas balloon. We put the, the, all the clusters harvested by hand in there, and then we have a computer and we gently inflate the balloon. 
at 0.2 bar intervals. One bar is one atmosphere, not a lot of pounds per square inch, right? We go at 0.2, so we're very, very gentle. And then we taste that juice. And we just wanna make sure we're not like breaking seeds or, or extracting too much of the stem character. And then we might increase the bladder uh, press to 0 0.4, 0 0.6. Now, usually with whites, we'll probably, probably take it up to 0.8 bars, maybe one bar of pressure, one atmosphere. And then we take that juice and we stick it in a, uh, in a tank for a few days. Because just like when we looked at the sparkling wine, you saw all that the haze. So a lot of that haze has got a lot of good material in there for the yeast to eat. But if there's too much, it can be slight, it can make the fermentation a little bit sluggish. So what we do is we put it into a separate tank and we let it sit for a day. And all of the heaviest particulates start to precipitate down toward the bottom of that tank. And then we will remove, we'll, we'll let the heaviest stuff stay at the bottom. We'll remove the more clarified juice and then we'll put that into a stainless steel tank, or we'll put it into a barrel, or we also have a concrete egg, which we're, where we'll initiate fermentation. And then we'll ferment very, very cold because wines will, uh, if you just let the, the yeast naturally eat that sugar, it will make a fermentation in days, like five, six days. But we might not get the complexity that we're seeking. So what we do is, we drop the temperature into, uh, you know, like 60s, basically. So then the yeast eats slowly, slowly eating that sugar so that we can get more complexity and, uh, and elongate that fermentation cycle out. So if we just let it go by itself, five days. We're going to try to go for our white wines. We're going to try to get maybe a 30-day fermentation, uh, really, really slow and slow, low and slow because that way you get more complexity. And then uh, once fermentation is complete, depending on the grape, we'll either age it in stainless steel or we'll age it in oak barrels um, for uh, a period of time. For this Pinot Blanc, we did it in a combination. I think I sent you the tech notes before. Uh, I can kind of share it. Let's see if some of that's on there. And we are, we're always kind of, uh, a lot of people ask, um, are we using, what kind of oak are we using? Are we using American oak? Are we using Central European oaks, like from Hungary or from uh, Slovenia? But uh, and, and unless otherwise specified, we're definitely gonna be fermenting, or excuse me, fermenting in some cases, or aging in French oak barrels. And French oak barrels are not cheap, uh, basically about a thousand euro. So, and you have 300 bottles in one barrel, so if you just do the math right there, 300 bottles in, depending on what the euro's uh, valuation is, you know, you're looking at between three and four dollars per bottle just to be aged in, uh, if you want to be aged in a new, new oak barrel. We typically don't want to have new oak on this because that new oak will overpower the aromas and flavors. So I'm going to get a little, a little whiff here. Hoping you, I see some people swirling. Okay, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna take you off mute, and if somebody would like to ask a question, I know I've been lecturing. You can tell my voice is barely even working at this point. It's such a tragedy. Uh, any questions? Uh, is that Mike there is Mike. Are you scratching your head, or are you are you raising a question? Oh no, I was scratching, scratching. I'm all right. I'm Mike, all right. I'm enjoying your, I don't myself. Put your hands near your face. You should not be touching your face. So I'm. Uh, I know. I'm uh, giving you a, I, a I, lesson. I, I know. Uh, at this point, I probably didn't wash the skin <laughs> off. I'm, I'm going. I'm washing okay. so much. But, uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> any anybody else with a question right now? I do still. When okay. you when the ice was on the top of that bottle. Yeah. Yes. How did you? Um, how do you get that out of there? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I'm, that's a great question. So, Thank you. She said you're screaming. So when when we have, I, I can't really turn the bottle upside down right now because my wine will pour out. But if when you saw on that video, the bottles were going through the glycol like that, and it forms a, 
a big kind of ice crystal. Um, and why don't, why don't I go back to it and I can kind of point it out to you. Uh, whoops. Sorry about that. So we'll show it going into the bath. And so now they're all sitting it out here. It, it, we'll see them come out short. I'll fast forward just a little bit to see it come out. Right. Right here. And I know my little screen is popping up. You can see that ice. So that's on the outside of the bottle, okay? And what it's done though, it's it, that, that glycol has frozen it so much that the yeast is on the inside and it's just made this little salad thing. Now, there, it's not really like a layer of ice. It's not like a big ice cube sitting on there. It's just really frozen. And just in that little bit where it, it travels that next 15 feet, you know, the room, it's the Bay Area. So the room is, our temperatures here who are from, from the, for those who are not from around here, um, in where, where, where we're doing this our, for our bottling, you know, temperatures a lot of times in the cellar are going to be around 61 degrees, uh, 63 degrees. So pretty darn cool Fahrenheit that is. And so it starts warming up immediately, but that ice is not going to be in contact with, uh, with any of the juice on the inside. Uh, I don't know if that was a bad in, uh, in, uh, explanation, but that, did that make sense? Yeah, it does. So the ice is on the outside, not the inside. ice. Ice is on the outside. Yeah. Okay. And, That's uh, right. and we're not really, not really freezing the juice. Although that would be a topic for next week when we talk about the, the Grenache Blanc. We are going to bring. We're going to talk about bringing the temperature right down to about freezing. And could anybody else want to raise their hand and give me a little wave and ask a question? Yeah, Evan. Yes. Um, so I'm actually. I'm going to go back to the uh, Blanc de Blanc. Uh, yep. You said the dosage on the bottom bottle, it says 1%. What does that 1% actually indicate? Okay, so we're looking at different percentage. We're looking at parts per million of sugar within the volume of here. And that is, there's different classifications of, uh, you know, you'll see like demi-sec or extra brut, which actually means more sugar. So it's just a volumetric, it's just a calculation of sugar to, uh, to the volume that you're putting in there. And for all intent, that is, con that is considered bone dry. Like that uh, legally or stylistically, there is so little sugar in there that uh, that it, it it won't even help put the medicine go down. <laughs> I have an unrelated question. Yeah, of course. And and somebody has explained it to me, and of course I forgot. But what is that indent in the bottom of the bottle for? Okay, so Evan just asked about what's called the punt, and you'll notice on uh, some bottles. It's uh, very, very pronounced. And on some bottles, like they don't even have them. So for sparkling wine, a punt is necessary, really necessary. Why? Well, first of all, the punt, almost like an arch on a bridge, acts for stability purposes. It is going to make, it is going to uh, um, decrease the amount of pressure in that bottle. And for sparkling wine, that's really important because we're putting C, we're trapping CO2 in there and the bottles are, uh, it, it can compromise the glass. In fact, in that gyro palette, the video we saw where we were laying the bottles in there and it's slowly coaxing, we're going to get a couple of bottles every year that are going to crack and pop from that. Um, but on still wines, let's say on the Pinot Blanc, yes, it still helps the bottle be more stable. But you'll, you'll feel like when you pick up the Pinot Blanc, like this is, I, you know, this would be considered a weapon in about 17 states, right? Because this, this bottle's got some heft to it. So then some people will use it to displace the actual glass and have it be the perception of more power 
and a bigger, uh, it's, it's basically in some ways it's marketing. Um, it can be problematic on some, uh, on some, if you have some like wine storage things, particularly like the wooden ones or some wine refrigerators, when you try to put these bigger bottles in, it tears the labels, right? So, cause it, it's just not big enough. A number of years ago on one of my wines, uh, I was one of the people who bought my wines. I was really honored to go to their house and they were cursing me out because they, they had to re they said they had to replace all of their wine shelving units to get bigger ones so that the bottles could actually fit in the, uh, in the shelving thing. So I hope that answers the question. Does it, Evan? Yes. No, I was curious. Um, I noticed in the video, you guys used it to add an extra half of inch so you could stuff more bottles into that so uh, then, area. Yeah. So then we were kind of nesting those bottles during that, that, uh, that, that period of aging. Correct. Uh, and, right. and it's going to, you know, we're going to do that for a long time. And we, we are opening those bottles every few months. On that one video where I kind of showed us kind of actually filling, filling the wine bottles, we opened up um, our, uh, our 2018 during that time, and we were tasting it. So that was, oh, maybe six weeks ago, seven weeks ago. And we're like, okay, it needs a couple more that months really of bottle aging yeah. before, we, before we let it go, uh, before we actually start labeling it up and get ready for it. Um, any other questions? Uh, looks like Valerie Von Berg uh, is, is raising her hand. Valerie? So I have a question for you, Stu. So this particular Pinot Blanc, how does it compare to, how does this interpretation compare to other interpretations? Is it typical? Is it different? Yeah, so what, what Valerie raises is something called wine style. And within any grape, um, you'll have people who like really big, rich, round interpretations of the grape, and you'll have people who like really light, more elegant interpretations. Um, and I'm going to answer your question in a second, but you'll often hear people say, oh, I don't like Chardonnay, because the dominant discourse of Chardonnay coming out of California is very rich and round. I call it a Chariots of Fire wine, because there was that movie Chariots of Fire in the early 80s, excuse me where they're always running in slow motion down the beach and it's like, like this, okay? So though I call those rich round opulent interpretations, chariots of fire wines. No offense to Van Jealous who did the soundtrack. Um, for, for ours, we take a different path where some Pinot Blancs, like some interpretations of Chardonnay can be rich and round. We try to dial it back. And for that reason, instead of aging all of it in oak, we age part of it in stainless steel. What's the difference? Oak is wood. And with oak, you can get a little bit of oxygen exchange. The wood is porous, right? So oxygen's getting in there. And so the wine is aging more rapidly. And the oak compounds are leaching into the wine. And it's going to make it richer, more buttery, round. That's great but we don't want it to be too rich. We don't want two giant tubs of buttered popcorn. We want to have uh, some focus and clarity to it. And for that reason, we age a portion of it in stainless steel. It's non-reactive, there's no oxygen getting in there, and so it's all gonna be focused, crisp, light. Then when we sit down at the blending table, our winemaker Patrick will have maybe 15, 16 glasses in front of him, and he's then going to become kind of a mad scientist, just like when you cook at home. When you're, when you're putting your blend together in the winery, you're not going to put all of barrel A and all of barrel B and all of barrel C. You just don't put it all into a big tank and bottle it up. You make a greatest hits package out of it. You take 80% out of this barrel, 60% out of this barrel, 25% out of that barrel, 100% out of that barrel. I don't know what we're going to do with that barrel. And then you assemble it so it has the focus, clarity, and purpose, the wine style that you are looking for. So ours, to answer your question in a long way, it ends up lighter on the spectrum, a little bit leaner, but there's a lot of complexity in the back end of the palate, particularly, and on the aromatics. And that is from, uh, by aging that combination of oak 
and stainless. Um, did that answer your question? Yes, very well, thank you. Sure. Um, anybody else? Uh, it looks like yeah, Steve, Ryan. Ryan. Steve Ryan, Steve? It's, it's not so much a question, but since, you know, we've kind of uh, encouraged you to open two bottles of wine tonight, and it is a Friday, so maybe you'll crush them both. But for your sparkling wine, if you don't have a stopper, a very good cheat is to take a spoon or a fork or some sort of uh, stainless utensil. Nice, Dad. I like it. Uh, the family drop it in there. And the metal is going to keep the, the neck cold when you're put in the fridge. And then you're going to go ahead and, and keep the CO2 in there. And it'll keep the bubbles in there for a couple of days. It's a total cheap hack, which is, which is great. So I'm going to, uh, I'm going to mute Anything myself. Anything else over? Yeah, that absolutely. Yeah, thank you. It, it's absolutely a, a great thing. And if you're kind of worried just about fine preservation overall, then same thing. You can either... Uh, you can either seal it, but by chilling it also helps slow that oxidation. Steve's method of preserving the CO2 in there with the metal, it's great, especially if it's heavy metal. And then, uh, and then uh, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a great preservative. If you have smaller bottles too, it's another great way. You transfer it to a smaller bottle, like a half size bottle and then pop it in the fridge. Okay. But Stu, so I have yeah. a question. Sure. Why would you have, a uh, bottle of sparkling open for more than one day. So that is that is the age old question, right? So uh, I don't know. It, it, it's a terrible <laughs> tragedy, you know. Uh, Shotzi, your schnauzer has been injured. You have to get Shotzi to the dog hospital. That's when we would take action there. But very very good question. Um, hey, I just want to just want to say thank you for joining us on the, on a Friday uh, and tasting with us. Uh, I hope you enjoyed these two interpretations. I'll stick around a little bit later uh, to answer more questions. Um, and then next week, same bat time, same bat channel, we're going to uh, open up two new bottles next week, the Grenache Blanc and the Philosopher. And then we'll kind of create this narrative over the four wines. Thank you, stay safe, and cheers, everybody. Cheers. 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 Thanks, Stu.